Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we so appreciate you taking your day to be with us here. Um, and um, our volunteers are all over the place to welcome you and to get a chance to talk to you. Um, my name is Marilyn Colon. I am the state events coordinator. And I can tell you I've been with Convention of States since 2019, and I totally love it. it it's uh, what I do every day, and I get to do it alongside some great people that have become like family to me. Um, so before we get started, we still have people coming in, but um, I wanted to review some logistics. So um, first of all, important, we have a raffle going, and if you checked in and didn't get a raffle ticket, please go back there and just remind someone or one of the ladies that are at the reception table to please um, give you a, a raffle ticket. We have uh, three prizes scheduled for later today, so please do that. Um, secondly, another important logistic matter, the restrooms are ladies right here on the, at this door, and the gentlemen are in that door. <laughs> Uh, okay, so our program for today, it, um, we have it projected on each side of the room and also in the lobby. So to give you an idea of how we've scheduled a day for you, um, we'll have an opportunity to have two QAs and get a chance to talk to you and um, provide additional information. So to kick it off today, we have um, our... Um, co-director for Convention of States for New Jersey, a very dear friend of ours. We admire him and we truly love him so much. Um, Chris Garzino. Hello. How's everyone today? Great. So I just want to reiterate what uh, Marilyn said. I, I want to thank everyone for being here. I know everyone has busy lives. It's raining. Uh, but being here, your attendance is important for us to maintain the America that we all love. So it's about getting involved. Uh, we got a great event planned for you today. You're going to hear from a lot of our uh, volunteers, and they're going to talk to you about how we're progressing, what they do within the organization, why they joined, just to give you a um, idea of what Convention of States is all about. And then at the end, we'll, we'll have Bill Spadia, and he'll give you his comments, his take on Convention of States. And I think it'll be, you know, very enlightening and exciting. So before we kick things off, I'm going to bring up Bob Norton. He is our Northeast Region Captain. And he's going to take us through a, a blessing to kick the event off for us. I'm Bob Norton, a volunteer with Convention of States five years. Uh, we're going to begin with prayer, and the prayer that I have was written by George Washington before he was president when he was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. So let's pray together. Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou wilt keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be happy, a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Black. He is our assistant uh, Northeast Region Captain, and he's going to lead us in the pledge. Ed? Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome. And if you would, yes, please stand and remove hats. We'll do the pledge. I pledge allegiance. Thank you. All right, and we have a real special treat for you today. So we have Mary Buckley, who is our district captain in District 10. She's going to come up and lead us in singing the national anthem. I would ask that everyone join in, and let's make it a group event, please. Thank you. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the reports we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the Wasn't that great, folks? Thanks for joining in, too. Thank you, Mary. So uh, isn't this facility a great church? Ah, it's beautiful, right? So I want to thank Pastor Roselli and his congregation for allowing us to use this for our event today. Uh, they've been gracious enough to allow us to use it free of charge. So what I would ask is if you care to donate, when you leave, there'll be a basket up front uh, on the registration table. All donations will go to the church. So don't feel obligated, but it would, you know, if you fit, care to give a dollar, five, whatever it is, please do. So my question for everyone is, who by a show of hands is happy with the direction of our country? Anyone? I, I will tell you, I was a little concerned that we might get one or two people who raised their hands but I'm happy to see we're all like-minded. Uh, but you're probably, you know, your question is probably, well, what, what can I do? And, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, <laughs> Article 5 of our Constitution is the answer. What Article 5 does, it is, allows we the people to add amendments to the Constitution, very simply. And the reason it's in our Constitution is because our founding fathers had enough foresight to realize that, you know what? A government is going, the government will grow tyrannical, and when they do, they're not gonna reel themselves back in. So here we are today in that position, um, and Convention of States is working using Article 5 to add amendments to our Constitution. But we have another mission, and that's to grow the largest self-governing volunteer army in the country. And we're well on our way to doing that. We have over five million supporters. Um, and a lot of our volunteers have 
run for Board of Education, run for town council, uh, run for county or, or taking part in county committees, even uh, running for state legislator. So you see what's happening is we're having a dual effect. We're having a sandwich effect on our federal government. We're, hand, we're, we're reeling them back in at the federal level, and then we're squeezing down from the local level to get better government. And that's really what our founding fathers, that's the government they built for us. The federal government has limited power, the states have most of the power. That's been flipped. So what we're working to do is we're working to put it back to what the Constitution laid out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up Carlo Nardone, he's our legislative liaison. He's gonna go through uh, Article 5, the whole process, a little more in detail. He's gonna talk about our legislative process nas nationally and then locally here in New Jersey. All right, uh, show of hands, who's new? Like, this is your first COS event, you just started. Excellent, excellent, so about half of you, perfect. All right, give folks a round of applause. All right, so one of the things I wanna to try to get folks in is the COS mindset a little bit. And it, we ask ourselves, how did we get here? So Mark Meckler, some of the things that he's been you know, informing us about, one of his theories is we're living and operating in what we'll call the post-World War II era. We're still operating under those sets of rules. We had this great homogenization of the culture after World War II. You had broadcasting, you had I guess McDonald's in every corner of the country. You had information, oh, folks can hear me now? You had information that was one way coming down, and there was a homogenization of the country. We shared something great, the victory after World War II, and then something happened. We had the internet, other things too. We had the internet, and all of a sudden, communication was different. It was two way. There was a lot of different ideas, different ideologies that were able to get air and then uh, you know, cultivate across the country. So we, we started to revert back to the situation where folks have different values, folks have different expectations about how they want to be governed. And that's led to this friction we see at the national level. You're trying to take a uniform system at the federal, federal level and say, hey, in the worst case, 51% of the population can dictate, or 51% of the representatives can dictate what the other 49%, how they will live, how they'll worship, how their money will be spent. And it's just not working out. Now, we've come a long way since the founding where we start off with this idea of federalism, meaning we have the states in charge of most of the important details of your life, and those things that are not reserved to the states are not reserved to the federal government, but reserved to the people. So what COS is trying to do is take that power, that focus, that attention away from D.C. and back at the local level where it belongs. So everyone understand that as far as how do we get there. So this past week, just to give you an example of what we're up against, I want you to maybe envision, you know, and pick an individual. What does that individual look like that might be causing the friction in this country? If that individual to you looks like an orange image or someone who's in their ninth decade on earth, <laughs> I, would argue, I would argue that it's, it's not either of those. It's primarily this growing federal bureaucracy. This past week, Rand Paul was at a Senate committee where he's been requesting information from the State Department around how funding of coronavirus research um, happened. I'm not taking a position on coronavirus or anything like that, but the point is, Senator Paul went to the, um, I believe it was the Honorable uh, Mr. Blinken, the Secretary Blinken from the State Department and said, I would like these unclassified documents, please provide them. They're not being provided at the rate that the elected representative of Kentucky has been asking for. Oh, we'll give it to you, we'll, put it, we'll go to a skiff, we'll tell you, the people's representative, what we wanna tell you about that research. We're up against this growing bureaucracy, this self-sustaining behemoth in DC that's detached from us, detached even from your representatives. They're not even responding to the people's representatives who have constitutional oversight authority. So the reason for this is because the COS organization nationwide we're a nonpartisan organization. We're political, this is a very political thing we're doing, but it's nonpartisan. So we have to pull away from the idea of it's Democrat versus Republican, it's left versus right. It's all of those people, uh, not against, but saying, pushing back against DC, saying the bureaucracy, the entrenched politicians that have been there for 60 years or whatever, and some of them are like that. That's the issue. That's why there's so much friction in the country right now, because we people are demanding that we live 
be able to live differently under a common framework of the Bill of Rights, under a common protection with the US military, under a common currency. Very basic things, but everything else at the state level. Are you with me so far as far as you know, why this is important, how we got here? Okay, so what's happening nationwide? In order to get the convention called, we need to get 34 states to sign on. Does anyone know how many states so far have signed on? I heard 19 and 20. I believe the number right now is 19 unless something changed last night. Uh, <laughs> so 19 out of 34, so we're more than halfway there, doing great. This year so far, we've had, um, I believe, two chambers, I'm sorry, two states have gone ahead and passed out of one of their two chambers, so that could be number 21 and, I'm sorry, number 20 and 21, and then three other states have passed out of their committees. I'll explain the committee process in a bit. So there's momentum, and there's a lot of states on the table that you would think would be supportive of this who have not signed on yet. So I wanna encourage folks is that 2023 should be another big year where we get maybe up to 25 more states. There's a map on the wall giving you an idea of who's signed on. That's gonna be states in green. And then there's other states in blue and yellow that either have it passed out of one committee or another. Okay, so you can see where, you know, we're making a lot of progress on the map. So I want folks to be encouraged by that. And while it might seem like 34 states is a long, long distance away, this is something historic. As we get closer, it's going to be harder and harder for even states like New Jersey to not at least address the growing momentum. You know, a, a reporter getting in front of the face of someone like the former Senate President Steve Sweeney and saying, you know, there's only one state to go. What do you think? <laughs> right? So we're, we're, we're approaching that point where this is going to be spoken about at the national level and at the local level. This is where you all come in. There's going to be attacks about how this is a dangerous process. And we're going to need folks like you out there explaining it to people, explaining it to your politicians, your mayors, other folks, other influential people who you know, know the politicians, business owners, about what this is and what it isn't. Okay, so that's the, that's the impetus of what we're doing. At the state level, what's the progress are we having right now? We have the piece of legislation, the resolution, in both the Senate and the Assembly. Okay, both have to pass in order for any state to be uh, approved as part of the, uh, adding to the 19, okay, out of the 34. So we have both those resolutions. In the Assembly, we've got 25% support, and in the Senate, we've got about 15% support, though that number is low because some folks that signed on last time haven't renewed yet, but they're still supporters. Uh, in the Senate in particular, a, a particular bright spot this past year has been, it's now a bipartisan resolution. Great work was done by the district captains in Senator Gopal's region. And is that district captain with us today? The one, or maybe they're not a district captain? The individual that was working with Senator Gopal? Bill couldn't make it. So Bill, was it Bill Smith? So I, I, do, wanna, I do wanna thank Bill Smith for the, the work that he was doing. He was politely asserting the COS principles, why it's important to him. And Senator Gopal, a Democrat, has signed on. We will not get there unless we get broad-based support. We need a lot of Republicans and a strong coalition of Democrats in order to get there. So we've cut our teeth on the bipartisan aspect. That's, that's a great sign for us. So how does the process work? I gave you a quick status. Well, a sponsor creates the, legis uh, the resolution, which is a copy of every single, the same resolution across every single state in the country. Every state you see there that signed on has the same exact resolution talking about term limits, fiscal responsibility, and limiting the size and uh, the powers of the federal government, okay? That resolution is the same. It gets sent over to a committee. Committee folks review it. If it uh, gets approved out of the committee, then it goes to the full assembly and the full Senate for final sign-off. The important thing there is, does everyone know who Governor Murphy is? Okay, okay. He's not involved. So if anybody here is, oh, I heard a clap. <laughs> So the executive branch is not involved, and that's not just true of New Jersey, but other states. And that's important because the founders said, hey, you know, the voice of the people, the full assemblies, the Senate, et cetera, they're the ones that really, if they call a convention, it shouldn't be you know, pigeonholed or kicked back because of the executive branch. So if those of you are worried about saying, well, I don't think Murphy would ever sign off on this, blah, 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 irrelevant. Don't even worry about that. Okay, so that's, again, it's a little bit more good news, hopefully, for folks. So uh, any questions so far? Before I, before I continue. Yes. Oh, it started at least 10 years ago, Chris, I would say, right? Right. Yeah. 
So um, won't go to too many questions right now. I do want to get through the rest of this. Uh, so what is our, kind of our strategy for the state? Initially, when we started as a group, I'd say we started in Ernst about six years ago when we had folks really you know, signed on. We were concentrated around District 40, the Wayne area, and it was just growing the grassroots. If we saw a politician, talk to them about it. But recently, under the guidance of Chris, um, we've been saying, hey, let's focus on maybe the committee members. You know, this has to go through the committee. So we've been working with the regional captains, who then work with their district captains, to find the committee members and start to brief them, influence them, saying, hey, this is something we want to talk about. We got great feedback over the last year that basically the committee folks said, if you really want this to get passed, we have to focus also on the, what I call the big four, the president of the Senate, the majority leader of the Senate, the speaker of the assembly, and the majority leader of the assembly. Those are not all the same person. And I, I know for, for many folks that might be news, you know, but the president of the assembly, I'm sorry, the president of the Senate and the majority leader of the Senate, not the same individual. So we really have to work on trying to influence those folks at, a, at the state level in order to get this into the committee and then ultimately get it passed. So that's kind of what we're up against. The team is working a, a strategy on kind of a, you know, pairing up with certain regional captains, folks that you know, might have connections and seeing if we can get some face time with these individuals. Now, the legislative team, what do we do to help you? Okay, so the district captains and the regional captains, what I tell them is the legislative team is a resource. How many folks have not met with a legislator before or a member of their staff have not met? Okay, so about maybe a third, third of you have not met. So one of the things that the legislative team offers is the ability to give you information, insight into, you know, how do, you, how do we get that first meeting? Right? So if you're in your district, I don't go around to every single district and, and beg a politician to come see me. They, don't, they say, what district are you from? I'm from Pompton Plains. Sorry, I'm in southern Jersey. I don't really care about you. This is why it's important at the local level you get involved with your, uh, your district representative. Okay? So we work to have you guys set up that, that interface, and then the legislative team provides documentation, information, pointers. We can even brief the assemblyman or woman or senator or whomever it is. So we're a resource available to district captains, regional captains, volunteers, if they have questions about well, what do we do, what's the kind of messaging we use. So just want to let you know, if you've got questions, just come see me. And uh, Chris, is there anything else you want me to cover? Are we good? Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carla. That was a great explanation. So earlier when Marilyn introduced me, she mentioned that I'm the co-state director. The gentleman who's gonna come up now, Jim Collinsworth, shares that role with me. Um, and I'd like to say he's really the rock of the New Jersey organization. So he's gonna take you through our growth, uh, people growth within the state, and uh, has some good information for you. Jim, thank you. Thank you, Chris. No. I can't do what I do without Chris's leadership, so don't let him fool you. I'm here just filling in and doing a few different things. Uh, here in New Jersey, one of the biggest roles with COS and here in New Jersey we're pushing for is district captains. And shortly after this meeting, we'll also we'll be going out and sending another email out to people and volunteers to see who wants to be a district captain. As of right now, we have 27 district captains covering 23 of the 40 legislative districts. So you can see we've got a little bit of ways to go. But three years ago when I started here, I was one of five district captains. So we've come a long way over the years. Um, we do have now five regional captains. Um, you met Bob already and Aid. Uh, we got a couple more out there and we cover, each regional captain covers eight districts within that certain area of New Jersey. I cover the Southern District. Bob covers the Northeastern District. Jan sitting over here, she covers the Northwest. And we got Daniel doing the Central East. Bill Smith and Tara is here somewhere. They cover the Central East uh, District. So uh, they, what they do is they help the district captains, they help train them and help bring them along, support their meetings and anything else that goes on that needs to happen. Um, the district captains, they are really the heart and soul of what we do here at uh, Convention of States, right? They are the individual who starts the process to try and go in and meet the legislator they, like, they go and introduce them. They're going to help, you know, as Carlo explained, they'll take all that information, explain the Convention of States to them, and try to convince them to support us. They are holding and hosting meetings in their uh, districts. 
so that we can bring new, more volunteers in, uh, teach people about convention estates, and give them a little bit of history at times. We have some very interesting uh, district meetings all across. We have an, actually nine district meetings across the state now, up from one or two only a couple of years ago. And like I said, we review district, uh, what, they, what we do here at Convention Estates, and we give a little bit of history uh, behind it. Uh, the other thing that they do is they search for events in their areas. They are the leader that goes out into their districts and their local towns and looking for town fairs, town days, uh, other things that they can do. There was some, some St. Patrick's Day stuff that we've done. We're trying to do some Fourth of July things, some parades. But we do a lot of community events around the state, wherever we can get a booth in to educate people more about what Convention States is trying to do um, and get them to sign our petition. I've been asked several times about petitions. How many do we need? I can tell you we need enough in each district to convince 41 assembly and 21 senators to vote and pass our resolution, right? So there's no real total we need. We don't need 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever. Obviously, the more we have, but we need them concentrated enough to where as we walk in and a Legislators kind of on the fence whether they want to support us or not. We can walk in there and say, hey, we got 2,500 people looking for somebody we can support, right? And when you think about the local elections, that can help swing an election, and that kind of support will help turn a legislator over to us. So there are some of the things that the district captains can do. Um, Chris already mentioned it. We are the nation's largest grassroots organization ever in the United States, all right? And you ask the question, when did it start? And a lot of people say, well, it takes forever, it takes too long, and this and that. This is not meant to be a rapid process. It's a very difficult process to get an amendment, right? We only had 27 amendments over 240 some odd years, right? So to get a convention of states, this takes even longer because we need you, the people. In fact, you see the shirts around here, it's us, we, the people, right? They talk about where the power comes from. The federal government and our state government gets power from everybody out here. Right? We're the ones that elected them. They're hopefully the ones that we're going to have the same values as what we have. And we put them in, in a place to make decisions for us. And if they don't make the proper decisions or they don't like the decisions, then we have the power to vote them out. Unfortunately, as Carlo has said, that hasn't worked on the national level. Right? Voting them out. Right? Nobody likes Congress. They got some very low approval ratings, but everybody will put their individual congressional representative back into office, right, year after year after year. And I can go through a whole list of politicians, and you probably know them all and heard them all out there, that have been there since Ronald Reagan was in office. We have another one that's already run. He actually entered office under Gerald Ford. How many presidents have we had since then? How many people were alive when Gerald Ford was... <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. You know, and he's still in office. No offense to him, but you know, it's time to move on. Give somebody else a chance. When our founders created this and created this great document called our Constitution, they were farmers, blacksmiths. They did other things. They went in and served a little bit and they went home and did their business. They were not career politicians that we have now, right? And that's where all that power lies. You think about that. These people have been there all through all these presidents. Who are the ones you always see on the news? They're the ones that have the power, the power to purse, right? They'll never give that up unless we do something about it, which is what we're trying to do here, all right? Um, we do have state teams in every state across the country. And as you saw, almost all of them have a resolution. I think Connecticut was the last one, and they're trying to get their resolution introduced this year. Um, and there are 863 district captains across the nation that are working with this. Uh, last summer, uh, or last fall, I should say, nine of us from New Jersey went down to a leadership summit in Orlando, led by uh, our state leaders or national leaders, and there was over 600 of us down there, and it was a wonderful, wonderful convention. You can go to our YouTube channel, and you can watch some videos of that. Individuals like Mark, Mech um, Mark Levin spoke, at, he was our keynote speaker, but we had many other powerful leaders, okay? And uh, hopefully in the near future, We've had Mark Meckler at our um, Cos Fest. It'll be coming up in May. Uh, he won't be able to be here this year. We were working on his co-founder of Convention of States, Michael Ferris, to be here. And we're still working on that to see if we can get that to happen for this year to have that. So are there any questions about Convention of States and what it is that we're trying to do? Yes, ma'am. 
We don't, our, our, our resolution is very vague when it comes to that for all the different things, even with the balanced budget. What the general purpose of that is, we just say term limits for federal officials. What that means is they can go down there and the representatives from all 50 states would then hammer out. Would that be two terms? Could that be four years or two terms? Two terms at four years, right? Could be term limits for um, judges. It could also mean term limits for those federal bureaucrats that never change. I talk about some of those that others have been in office for a lot of years. The bureaucrats, people, if they do rotate through, the bureaucrats are always there, right? So there could be some of that that's within that, right? Same thing with the balanced budget or the fiscal responsibility. Some people want to call it a balanced budget. In New Jersey, when they want to balance the budget, what do they normally do? Do they cut or do they raise taxes, right? So that's the problem with the balanced budget, right? You can raise taxes. But there are certain things that you, know, that you can do, like general accounting principles. Every business in the country has to follow general accounting principles when they file their paperwork to the IRS. The federal government doesn't do anything. They just said that general accounting office is, oh yeah, in 10 years they may balance the budget, right? They can't figure out what they're gonna have next year. So there are different things you could do that. And then by single item bills, right? Think about that omnibus bills. Right? If they had single item bills and every one of them was voted on, some of them probably wouldn't be in there. But that's another way to control that. And all of that is a way to bring some of that power back to the states, the decisions. Chris talked about on the local levels, right? Who knows your children better than you do? Does some school board administrator up in Washington know your children better? Right? When you talk to your teacher friends and they say they like the Department of Education, let them know that they're all administrators because they don't like administrators, right? And everybody's sitting down in Washington telling us what our kids have to learn, you know, or administrators. It's been a while since they've been in the classroom. So uh, that's all I have for now. And uh, I got one other person here. That's right, I forgot, I almost forgot about Daniel sitting over here. Daniel, would you like to come up here? We have a special presentation today. Um, a lot of our volunteers are extremely hardworking and every now and then we'd like to recognize one and Daniel, our regional captain's going to. Thank you, Jim, for sharing with us. Uh, and back earlier when Marilyn was welcoming you here, I just wanted to reiterate how important it is that you guys are all here. So thank you so much uh, for taking, making the efforts to come out here uh, on a rainy day, especially. And, you know, now, now that you're here, if this, especially if this is your first time, um, this is, you know, we're, we're, we always talk about that we're a family. So you're a part of the family, and we'd like to do something special here in a moment, and I'm going to need your help with, so uh, bear with me. It was once said that godly leadership is not about attaining recognition or glory. It's about serving others. And in a culture and generation where me become, comes before others, it's difficult to find people who are not willing to serve, but look forward to it. Bruce Nelson has been serving the volunteers in District 21 of Convention of States as a district captain now for four years. His leadership is humbly displayed in many ways. Bruce doesn't look to be recognized. Bruce takes care of most things without even being asked. Whatever needs to be done, he gets the job done. His attitude is, whatever it takes. He leads a great team of people who respect him and follow him. And Bruce leads as an example for all the other district captains in our region, as well as the state of New Jersey. So it's no surprise that his district trackable results are regularly at the top. Having been under Bruce's leadership for a year and a half, I have been honored to work with and to learn from Bruce. So at this time, it does me great honor to present a Patriot pin. Bruce, can you come on up? Bruce, would you like to share? Would you like to say a couple things real quick? Thank you. 
We truly do love Bruce. He's awesome. If you guys haven't had a chance, please go up to him after, after we're all finished and give him a big hug and tell him how much we care about all that he does. Here you go, Chris. Thank you. All right, folks. So in a moment, I'm going to bring up a uh, panel of volunteers and they're going to give you an idea of what it's like to volunteer with Convention of States, what's involved, how, how much time they spend each week, and then really what their responsibilities are for the different roles that they have. Uh, it, it's, it's obvious that any um, volunteer organization, the foundation is, is people, is the volunteers. And, you know, it's been said a few times here that we're family, and we really are. Uh, we, we have each other's backs. When new people come into the organization, we, we welcome them with op open arms and we do our best to train them so they don't feel like they're, you know, by themselves and have no idea what, what, what's going on. So uh, I'm really happy to bring up the next four people and uh, I'm always impressed with the efforts of not just these four folks, but the entire uh, volunteer uh, organization for New Jersey. So we're going to start off with Robin Hoy. Uh, next is Francesca Norton. And then we have Luis Alvarez. They're on the, they're on the thing. And then we have, everyone knows him now and loves him, Bruce Nelson. <laughs> so we'll get the hard questions out of the way first. So starting with Robin, why don't you tell us how long you've been part of Convention of States, what your role is with the organization, and you know what responsibilities you have with that role. Okay, um, this is on, right, on, everybody? Yeah. So I've been involved for about an hour, an hour and a half, a year, <laughs> <laughs> a year and a half. That's pretty good, huh? We're uh, signing up people as we speak. Um, a year and a half, I started just coming to meetings um, and helping with the snacks and stuff like that. So I really didn't have a part. But then I started doing, once I learned a little, and there's Convention of States um, University, so they have so much information to learn, um, I started being a follow-up team member. So what I do, if there's anybody that signed the petition today from District 21, I'll be calling you tomorrow. So I call follow-ups, um, call them, thank them for signing the petition, answer any questions they have, um, see if they'd like to volunteer. I'll text them. You know, a lot of people are, I'm busy, but I'm interested. So I'll text them um, reminders of big events we're having, things like that. Um, I also worked with, work with Bruce in District 21, so I help plan um, activities, we're really a family, so everybody helps out. So I'm the events coordinator. Um, now I'm the events coordinator for the region. So a bunch of the district captains get together and send me um, places that they want to have meetings at, whether it's a, a street fair or a gun show. And we all work together, and we get it scheduled and, and have it. So I guess that's it. Francesca? Francesca? Yes. Um, Jim, I'm a, I came to be in Convention of States in March of 2018. I started as a follow-up team member, and I became a district captain later. And Jim did speak about many of the roles of the district captain, and, and Robin did too, so I'm not going to repeat them. But I'll just add that I am a state content writer, so I write content, report events, I make flyers, press releases, whatever I can do. And the other thing is that I'm on the Prayer Warrior Squad, which is a national effort. So I try to sign on once a month to the prayer 
events that the National has, and I'll be let you know that I asked for a prayer for our meeting today, and I, I post meaningful and very important prayer requests on our personal communication platform, Slack. And the other thing I do is my husband is a regional uh, captain, so I help him a lot in all the things that we do together to build up our region. Lewis. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Alvarez. Um, I actually first got started with Convention of States back in the beginning in uh, 2014, around the time of the uh, first couple resolutions. Um, the, I then took a uh, little bit of a break, went back to school, worked on a couple of campaigns, uh, and then um, decided that um, after school the, I had to, it was time to get back to work on the uh, most important um, device that's uh, going to save our democracy. So here I am um, back with uh, Convention of States in, the district captain, uh, in, the, in a district captain's role. Um, back in 2014, uh, what kind of led me to the Convention of States was um, I, I had been active um, for a long time um, with the Tea Party in uh, 2010 uh, <laughs> to 2012. Um, when that kind of uh, reduced down to a uh, um, Ponzi scheme and uh, started to splinter out, um, I thought that there wasn't much hope for the uh, for the freedom movement in this country. And then um, I was listening to Mark Levin on the radio every single night, um, drowning in my sorrows uh, and uh, what the, where the country is going. And a caller called and he said, you know, what is the most important thing that we can do as citizens. And he said, you need to get with your local convention of states, and it's the convention of states in the Article 5 movement. Um, my initial thought was this would never uh, happen in New Jersey, but uh, I come to find out that uh, a, a classmate of mine uh, who grew up in the schoolyard, Mr. Jonathan Viad, uh, was uh, already um, holding meetings, and uh, it inspired me to see somebody my age uh, that was uh, so involved. And um, I decided that um, I had at least had to uh, fight the fight. And uh, over the last nine years, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how the organization has uh, grown. And the fact that there's this many people here to fill a room shows that uh, progress can be made even in a deep blue state like ours. And um, we, if we can do it, it can happen anywhere. Bruce? Yes, uh, I'm district captain of uh, 21, which is the district we're sitting in right now. Um, and uh, I started a little over six years ago. And the thing that got me uh, to, to buy into this was I, my son dragged me to a meeting uh, at the Ryder University where this guy was speaking. His name was Mark Meckler. And uh, he's the president of, and one of the founders of Convention of States uh, as we know it. Um, after his talk, uh, I was hooked. Uh, he, he, what he, everything he said uh, resonated with me, and uh, I, I got into it. Uh, I, I helped my son, and then he moved to Texas to get away from New Jersey. So, uh, um, and. Uh, uh, I, I've carried on, and uh, I have been determined to, to do that uh, because I believe in it uh, very much, and I think it's the only solution uh, to what we uh, what we are faced with today. And it's uh, we're going to lose our country if we don't do something different. Um, the the old saying: keep doing the same thing all the time, expecting different results. Uh, you know what you get. Uh, thank you, Bruce. All right, so we'll start with Bruce. What, what was the moment where you said, you know what, I, I need to do something, I need to get involved, I just... Uh, it, it was that moment at, at uh, Ryder College. Or, or at, I don't know if it's university or college. Uh, uh, and it was impressive, and I... I my, and my son really helped me too to understand uh, right from the beginning what what this was all about and uh it, it i i am not doing this for me uh but uh i'm i'm concerned about the future for my my children my grandchildren uh and 
it, the, the, the future of this whole country is, uh, is at stake. And that's, uh, uh, it's very basic. And uh, I look at it very simply, and uh, that's, that's, what I'm, uh, that's what I'm about. And you'll see it's a common thread amongst volunteers. We're, we're not here for ourselves. We're here for our children, our grandchildren, whatever it may be, because our, we're all about servant leadership. So it's really never about us. It's about, for the, about the other ones, our loved ones, and, and people in our lives. So, Lewis, why don't you tell us the same, same question? Uh, so, um, as I alluded to before, uh, the, the first um, big aha moment for me was um, listening to Mark Levin um, around that time and uh, hearing the, having the same, expressing the same uh, sentiments as that uh, distressed caller, as in, you know, what, what can we do? Uh, you must feel a little helpless at times when you, you know, read some of these headlines and you see, um, you know, the, uh, um, the, you know, ex exactly how large the federal mm -hmm. le leviathan has gotten. Um, and so um, that led me to read uh, Mark Levin's uh, The Liberty Amendments, which goes into much greater detail. Um, it, you know, it describes things that, uh, um, things that, we, um, that we can accomplish in the convention that uh, we're not even looking to do yet, but there's just expressing the different possibilities. Um, and after reading that and um, being able to see all the uh, the concerns that I had addressed, um, you know, the, the the biggest obstacle we have is uh, you know the runaway convention myth. Um, so uh, having that addressed um, in completeness um, was was what made the light bulb go off that you know this is um, the greatest um, this is the greatest tool we have as citizens, um, and that's really uh, in Article Five. That's that's you know this is the only thing that they gave us and. And this is it for us. I also was a signer of the Convention of States petition because of Mark Levin in 2016. But it really wasn't until 2018 that I understood what was going on more so. I first was troubled because we were called deplorables. And then it worked up to 2017 and the way Congress was resistant to every bipartisan measure and then when they pulled the plug on impeachment, I just, that was my first aha moment. And I looked for Convention of States. I found it on Meetup. I went to the meeting in Wayne that Jonathan Viad and, and uh, Bill Boniface had. They moved to Florida now, lucky ducks. <laughs> and Bob and I started attending and we volunteered. And then I think I, I had a second aha moment in, 19, in, tw in 2020 because of the way the government was telling us what we needed to do. And I just felt that there was a deeper thing going on than the pandemic. And so I decided that I would do more with respect to my own, own state. And I uh, ran for a local office, it's just county committee, but I am finding out about local government and I'm glad I did that. Thank you, Francesca. Robin? Um, so I guess my, um, the reason I joined Convention Estates was, you know, the government was doing a lot of things they didn't agree with and then COVID hit. And then they had crazy mandates. Your small store you can't open, but yet everybody can go to Walmart. Or just, it, it, it wasn't making sense to me. Um, and at the time I was working full time and I'd gotten COVID. So my husband and I sick for two weeks. I go back to work and they're mandating I get the vaccine. Like I just had it. Like never before in my lifetime have I seen that you need a vaccine for something that you've had. So, so I lost my job and here I am. So that was my, <laughs> I didn't get it. So this next question is for Robin and Lewis. Uh, so you decided you wanted to volunteer. Why Convention of States versus other organizations? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so um, the Convention of States, as I, uh, as I um, also like alluded to a little bit, um, the Article 5 Convention is um, literally our only way that we can bypass Congress. Um, 
And really what it comes down to um, is, um, you know, do I think that um, the Congress is going to limit their own power ever? Absolutely not. Um, and so uh, this being the uh, only device to actually um, get things done um, has proven to me that, um, that this is where I should be. The uh, results that we've seen on the state board uh, speak, speak for themselves. Uh, when I first started, there were absolutely zero states in green. Uh, now there are 19. Um, the fact that I have seen uh, hit pieces from MSNBC and uh, other things have shown that you know, our opponents are getting scared, which shows the progress. Um, and also my experiences in particular with other organizations um, led me here because this is the only organization that gets tangible results. Um, I attended uh, Tea Party meetings for uh, the, the earlier half of the uh, early 2010s. Um, you know, what did we get to show for that? Um, you know, we had a couple of uh, good elections, uh, some good people got elected. And then we also got some people who said that they were going to do what they said they were going to do and stand up for us. And as soon as they got in, uh, they, they turned tail and, um, you know, went the uh, easy route. And, you know, they're in with the rhinos now. Um, and uh, so this is the only organization that has seen or I've seen progress. Um, it's not all lip service. And, um, and specifically, I've also... Um, you know, it's, it's not just the um, like organization, citizen organization like the Tea Party. I've also been involved with our uh, state GOP, uh, state political parties, um, and <laughs> once again, you don't see results from them. They're more interested in uh, getting you to um, you know pay a couple hundred bucks to get a table at a fundraiser, and uh, they're not actually l interested in moving the needle for the people they're supposed to represent. The Convention of States does. Um, so I guess I joined Convention of States because I feel that Article 5 is um, what we need and to move forward. And I also feel like we're gaining momentum. Um, we had a couple states uh, pass a resolution this year, and I want to be a part of history. I'm going to save the country. All right, Francesca and Bruce. So. You guys have both been part of the organization for over four years each, and you know, you've, you've remained focused and motivated even though our resolution really hasn't made the progress we would hope uh, with the legislature. You know, what advice do you give to potential or new volunteers to get them ready for what's going to be a long process? Well, first, what you know, maybe once in a while I get discouraged, but I, overall I really don't. But I think about all the progress that Lewis alludes to that the Convention of States has made and continues to make, and uh, the growth of our state. My husband Bob and I started coming to meetings when there was only one meeting, and there'd be between, the two people would always hold it, but there'd be between six and 12 people. Now, there's, meetings all over the state with, I mean, we've, the most we've had at a meeting is 56, but, you know, there's people that are coming, the same nights we're having meetings all over the states, people want to learn. So I want, you know, think about that. And I think about the two centuries of the 1600s and the 1700s and our founding fathers and all that they did, you know, to have an independent country and to create a constitutional republic. I think about that. And I also think about it's not going to be a quick fix. I'd rather see us really steadily learn and grow and have really grounded support as opposed to our society and our media that teaches us that there's instant gratification and reality is not like that. And then the other thing that I would say for myself personally is that I really enjoy going to all the meetings, being with all the people, learning about the Constitution with them and or sharing something that I know with others. I really enjoy that, so I just encourage everybody to try to find meetings in your area and go, because it's very, very um, encouraging. And you want to identify with someone that believes like you. You know, I put my name deplorably patriotic on my Rumble page because <laughs> I just don't like, you know, and that was the thing that first, I guess, hit me really hard about the uh, opposition. Thanks, Francesca. Bruce? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, you know, I was, I was one of those eight and 12 people uh, at the, those meetings just, uh, what, six years ago, something like that. Um, and it, it, we've seen this organization grow tremendously in those six years. Uh, and I think to talk to somebody who poses that question and say, is this ever going to happen? Or they, they just don't see how it can happen. Um, you know, I might bring up the fact that the 27th Amendment took 202 years to get, pat to get ratified. Um, and uh, that, that's a long time. Of course, that was for the, the pay for the uh, legislature. So um, the, the one thing I think people have to understand is the process itself. Uh, to, I, I try to explain to them the process, which is in and of itself is a long process because you, you have to get people to introduce it to their legislators. Then you have to get work with legislators to work on it. You've heard how hard it is to uh, get legislators to come over to back this thing. Um, and that's just to get it out of committee. And then it has to go before the state legislature. And then it has to get passed. And then we have to get 34 states. Uh, and then there's a convention, at which time we come up with uh, proposed amendments that have to go back to the state and have to be ratified by 38 of those states. Um, that's a long process in and of itself. Um, and the, 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 I think the thing that gets to people is the fact that they, they say, I'm, I'm just one person, what, what can I do? Um, and you can do a lot of things that don't take much time. Um, and get, get involved. If, if we can get people involved so that they're doing something um, they, they tend to get with it and, and learn that what they're doing does create some interest, does, if they can get people to sign a petition or get that person to ask questions, answer their questions, get them on board, uh, that, that's one of the things that uh, um, grows an organization. And... Uh, it, it's, it is, it's, it's easy to get discouraged. Um, and it's easy not to see the, the picture uh, for the future. But we've got to keep at it. And it's those people who, who have that stamina, I guess, that uh, can last. And, and you don't have to donate a lot of time. To, to the organization. There's things you can do, get involved locally uh, with school boards or whatever, um, or just get people to sign petitions. That's important. Um, and you have to go with the flow with the person that's asking those questions and, and answer them honestly and don't don't uh, lead them down a path of thinking this thing can happen real rapidly because it won't. And honestly, New Jersey is going to be one of the harder states uh, to to get past. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, so Bruce, sticking with you, can you give us an update on where our resolution is in New Jersey? Or? Uh, I, I think I think we we heard a lot about it already. Uh, where it is, uh, it it is. Uh, I want to go back to. Uh, it's been on on uh, in the committees in the state legislature for several years now, and um, you just have to. Uh, know that, uh, well, 
let me start over. <laughs> I'm getting mixed up here. Um, I'm trying not to repeat what's already been said, um, but it does, it's sitting in two committees. The committees are, uh, if, if you want to make a note, uh, it's, uh, the Senate committee is uh, a S SCR uh, 45 and a the, the assembly is ACR 70. Uh, those are they, they've been reintroduced as we keep going on and they have to be reintroduced uh, each each uh, legislature um, and Carlos went over what the difficulty and even getting it out of committee we have to convince those people in those committees to bring it out of the committee that, that just takes a majority vote in the in the committee, and uh, it's it's sitting there. Uh, we are planning to have a uh, a visit to the state legislators sometime this year. Um, I don't know where we are in that, but uh, it, to go down and to pretty much uh, you know petition them to. Uh, at least listen to us and and get these committees to understand what fully what what it is and we're in district 21 right now uh, and all three of our legislators both assembly people and uh, our, our supporters of it two of them are co-sponsors um, and so that that's a pretty good place to be in, in a district, but we have to get that across the state. Um, and, and again, the legislatures have to understand that we've got enough power and we can't show that without people, a lot of people. And uh, it, it just, it's one of those things that uh, we're, we're continually working trying to find ways to convince those committee people to pass it out of committee. And once, once we get it out of committee and it goes on the floor, hopefully it will get passed. Um, again, when I, I'll go back a couple years, it, it didn't look like, uh, you know, we were ever gonna get there. Uh, and it doesn't look like, I, I want to give an example of uh, one of our representatives here, our, our state, he's our state senator now uh, in, in this district. When I told him that last year, you know, we just got three states to sign on to this and we're up to uh, 19 now. And uh, his first question was, are any of them Democrat states? Um, he's a Republican, but uh, he said, are any of them Democrat states? And I couldn't honestly answer that one of them was. Uh, but in the state of Massachusetts, uh, it has passed out a committee, and that is a committee that's controlled totally by the Democrats. Uh, so that's a good sign. And I think that's one of the things these people are looking for, uh, to see if, if we can get people across the line, uh, across the aisle, to sign on to this thing, uh, that'll speed up the process. And now that we've got one, we need to get more. And that, uh, that's really where it stands. I think right now our main goal is to get, get, uh, get both sides coming to fruition on this thing and, and uh, signing on to it. Great, thank you, Bruce, appreciate it. All right, so a, a question for everyone. So self-governance is one of the main tenets of Convention of States. What is your definition, starting with you, Robin, what's your definition of self-governance? Um, I vote a little bit. So I think it's about educating the citizens um, about their constitutional rights. 
And I believe it's the responsibility of all of us to get involved. We should all play a role on the decision making um, in our lives, whether it's the school boards or communities or you know, politics, something like that. So I think everybody, it, it's their responsibility to our children, our grandchildren to get involved and to be a part of it, not just sit back and expect somebody else to do the best what's for us because they're not. So, Thank you. Francesca? Well, thinking about this idea, I thought the most important thing is to know inside myself what guides my own moral compass. And I would say, first of all, it's my faith in, in Jesus Christ as my savior. And then that that instills principles in my life of how I want to learn and be and, and, and act towards others. And also, I think that it helps me to make solid decisions and not be swayed by the mainstream media and this voice and that voice and this and that and this and that. Thanks. Thanks, Francesca. Lewis? <clears throat> um, so um, as far as self-governance, um, I mean, uh, I, I like to um, think that um, I uh, represent a uh, kind of um, uh, movement um, towards liberty and uh, libertarian values in our youth, uh, whereas we see that uh, um, our children's um, futures are being mortgaged right now uh, by the federal government uh, because it's easy to say spend, 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 and it's hard to say no. Uh, it's the tough, it's the tough decision to say no, and um, you know what? How can we leave a, a, a country for future generations if there are mountains in, in debt and everything is all the decisions have been made for them? Um, there's going to be nothing left. Uh, we're going to be giving them no checks and balances as they're being eroded, um, and as and it all comes back to self-governance because every single si decision that the federal government makes makes for us is one less that we can't make we can make for our families. Um, and it's the exact same reason why the founders put Article 5 in the Constitution, because um, it's going to be up to us and the, and, and the states to um, uh, enforce that. I mean, um, and I just want to finish with, you know, um, the Tenth Amendment of the Bill of Rights um, says that whatever is not in the Constitution is left to the states, but if, if anyone in the federal government was following that today, we wouldn't have any of the laws that we have uh, today. Uh, I'll start with the dictionary definition. The ability of a person or group to exercise all necessary functions of regulation without interference from an external authority. <clears throat> I really think, very simply, I think that that's what it is. And, you know, this is what kids used to do. They used to go out and have a pickup baseball game. They make up their own rules and they, they uh, enforced them. Uh, that's pretty much self-government. Um, and that's what the pilgrims did uh, from the time they landed here until 1776. That's a little over 150 years. Uh, they, they learned to self-govern themselves, and that's, that's why they didn't want to lose that. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I look at it that way. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. So uh, Bruce and Robin, so what is the, what guidance do you give potential and or new volunteers uh, about Convention of States? Robin? Um, so as I said before, I'm a follow-up team member, so when you sign or somebody signs a petition, I'll follow up with them, give them a call, thank them for signing the petition, explain where it goes. When you sign the petition, it goes right to your legislatures of your district. So they know all the people that, you know, want this Article 5. Um, and I'll call them, I'll text them, I'll invite them to events. Um, once they say they're interested, they want to get involved, I give them the Bruce. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> well, one of, I, I think one of the things that, that I've uh, enjoyed, but also I think is quite necessary is when a person wants to volunteer, I want to meet with them face to face, uh, sit down with them, spend some time with them, and learn about them, uh, have them learn about us, and uh, explain what's involved, answer any questions they might have, uh, see how they can fit in, uh, give them 
ideas on what they can do to contribute their time, whether it's half hour a week, uh, half hour every two weeks, or occasionally, or they want to jump in feet first, that's, that's fine. And then guide them through. I mean, we, we have training. We have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to get a person started, we've got four lessons that can be done at home, uh, uh, just on your computer. It's, they're very good lessons, and it, they, they need to know a little bit about convention states before they get involved. Um, and and, and we've, the uh, convention states at university has a total of 24 lessons, and, and they're, they're all very good. Uh, so we do train. We want to stay with them, keep in touch with them, uh, show them that there are things to do, and, and keep inviting them, keep, uh, keep them interested, and above, above all, find something for them to do. Uh, getting involved is, is one of the things that keeps them coming. Great, thank you. All right, so. So Francesca and uh, Lewis, we, we are a political organization, uh, but what, what type of political participation did you both have before joining Convention of States? Um, I'd say that um, my sole political involvement was voting. I felt that voting was very important. But, you know, in retrospect, now of all that I know, I didn't really take the effort that I needed to find out about what the candidates really stood for and believed in. But I did always vote. But before that, I was not politically involved. Um, so, <clears throat> um, I've, I've been around for, um, for a while, so um, I, I've seen some ups and downs in um, convention estates, and uh, one thing I noticed was um, after the election of Donald Trump, there was a small down, uh, down tick in, uh, in action. Um, and uh, it was a little disheartening um, because the um, purveying um, emotions was that, you know, um, we had found a fighter for ourselves and that, um, uh, and that he was going to drain the swamp, and our and our jobs were done. But if if anyone has done in a deeper dive into our problems, we know that this this issue that we're trying to tackle is bigger than the executive. No one man can finish this, can fix this. Um, you know, you could resurrect Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, and they wouldn't be able to fix uh, fix the problems that we have going on right now. Um, and so. Um, it, initially, um, I had taken a step back um, to um, get a political science degree from Ramapo College. Um, I wanted to um, uh, personally um, get some uh, more of a, um, of a uh, uh, of some credentials uh, so that way I could um, assist in the fight. And um, initially, um, I had uh, taken a job um, as a volunteer um, as the volunteer director for um, Steve Lonigan. Um, who is my former mayor of, of a small town, Bogota, uh, Bogota in Bergen County. Um, and at the time, um, Mark Levin and um, Ted Cruz and uh, Rand Paul had uh, um, all endorsed him as the, um, the, grand, the uh, godfather of conservatism in New Jersey. So uh, I thought as a rebel, um, it, would be, it would be best to, um, to go along with someone like that. Uh, so I did work for him for a little bit. Um, we, we ran a, uh, a good primary campaign in uh, 2018. And um, after that, um, I did a little bit of work for the, um, for the state organization, which um, led me um, to be working for a candidate that I didn't necessarily um, believe in, in Bob Hugan. Uh, and after that, I decided that um, the state apparatus was not the way to go, and that it was only organizations like uh, citizen organizations like the Convention of States that are actually going to move the needle. Great. Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> all right, so our, our last question for all of the panel is give me your elevator speech on why I should join Convention of States. Let's start with Bruce. Well, as a, as a, you told me you were going to ask me that question, and I said I don't go in elevators. So, uh, but uh, 
you know, it really varies on the situation, and it might be as simple as uh, you have somebody and you start talking to them and ask them if they know about the Convention of States, and from there it can take off. And uh, the main thing, the idea that uh, I want to get across is that we're doing something uh, that those in, in power in Washington, D.C. will never do, and uh, should take our federal government back uh, so the people have more say in, in what what things uh, happen. Um, I, I just don't have one way of doing it. Uh, I've got I've got <clears throat> signs on both sides of my car about convention states, and surprisingly enough, that that evokes some questions to me that I can start a conversation with somebody that I never would have had a conversation with. Uh, or even if they just look at it, I, I'm going to ask them uh, a question about, do they know about it? So uh, it, you just have to look for those opportunities uh, to uh, get into a conversation and, and take it from there. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I just have never done anything in a one-way fashion. Lewis? Um, so kind of uh, to close, you know, I, I could sit here and rehash, you know, how this is, you know, how Article 5, important Article 5 is and, you know, how this is our tool that we can use. Um, but, um, you know, having such a big audience, uh, I just kind of wanted to um, hit on something important uh, with Convention of States is um, something funny, you know, you, you look at me and, uh, you know, do you think that you know Bruce and I would, would be friends, uh, you know, if we were in Tennessee here? You know, we, 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 the left, uh, you know, other pol political actors, they always say, "Oh, you, you know, we want people that look like me, so, you know, and and people who, who act like me or look like so." And that's it's a it's a, it's a bunch of crock. Let's be honest. Like, what, what what's up here is what matters. And if you want to meet other people who are like minded and maybe people that you wouldn't cross paths with, the and. Patriots, literally, today, we are today's Minutemen. Um, you know, I mean, we're answering the call. We we see a problem, and if you want to be, um, you know, involved and meet people like that, um, you know, this is the organization that you want to join um, because you're gonna, you know, be blown away at these meetings of people that you, you know, you would normally not cross paths with, and and you know, recognizing the problem, and it feels so good to know that there are people like you that are, you know, willing to uh, fight with you, even if they don't look like you, um, and uh, and um, you know, that's just uh, something that's unique um, to this organization, um, and um, yeah, I mean, really, that's uh, um, that's really what like, I'd like to um, leave everybody with, you know, the, uh, and, and you know, there's gonna be, um, as we pick up steam, there's naysayers, and if you go and tell somebody else about the Convention of States, you know, our first, we're human beings, our first inclination is to think negative. Oh my God, what could happen? You know, runaway convention. Are the, are the political actors gonna take, you know, are they gonna take over? You know, these are um, legit uh, questions people have, so it's up to us to not necessarily, uh, when someone comes up to those, to you know, to get angry or to look down upon these people who are asking these questions because they want to know. Um, and so I, f I feel like um, the more I get involved and the more I'm able to uh, explain this, uh, the process and how the how the process itself um, preserves us. And pres you know, we, it's impossible to run away if you get into. It. I mean, I could you know be here for an hour talking about the, the runaway and how it. it can't happen, but um, you have to, you know, you have to really like look up that information for yourself. You want to know, um, you know, w w you know how um, these things are restrained, and uh, um, having other people who believe in it, um, and you know, finding that camaraderie, and then doing the deep dive and finding out that you know we're right and this is uh, safe and stable and. Uh, and honestly, the reason why they're scared is because, you know, it's the, the people in power that we're, we're, we're looking to strip that, that power away. And that's really what, that's where all the fear mongering comes from. Thank you, Louis. Francesca? Well, what Bruce said is, you know, you have, to, you have to juggle your approach depending on what environment you're in or who you were with. But basically, I would really open, like, what do you think about what's going on with government? And hear what the person has to say and tell them all the basic things. But 
One thing that I stress is that I'm very concerned about our grandson, mm -hmm. our children, the debt on their shoulders, mm -hmm. and, um, and that my experience in that, and that it caused me to look back to the Constitution and what's constitutional and what's legal and what can I do specifically, and that's how I found the Convention of States, and not maybe give them a little history of me, my volunteerism or ask them for questions. It, it's, that's basically it in Thank 30 you. seconds. Thank you, Francesca. Mm -hmm. Robin? So, I don't, really, I don't really need to say anything. <laughs> Term <laughs> limits. Do you think our founding fathers, you know, wanted career politicians? So, I just have to wear this shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just real quick, uh, I have a strong, strong feeling that one of the worst things that's happening in this country is what is happening to our young people. And uh, <clears throat> what they're being taught, and, and if they end up hating this country, this country's done for. And, and I think dealing with these local uh, school districts is probably one of the most important things to deal with, to get them turned around <clears throat> and thinking the right way. Right, very. Great point. So I want to thank you guys for taking part in our panel discussion. I think, you know, what you've shared has been very ex insightful and uh, really gives people a good idea of what it's like to be a, a volunteer with us. So thank you very much. Let's give them another round of applause, folks. All right, so I am going to bring up Karen Bennett. She is our district captain in uh, District 17, and she's gonna introduce our next guest. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to introduce our next guest. Weekday mornings when I wake up, some of the first words I utter are, Alexa, play New Jersey 101.5, so I'm not getting my head off the pillow. And there we find Bill Spadia knee-deep in topics relevant not only to us in New Jersey, but throughout the United States. He engages with the listeners, honors police officers on Blue Fridays, supports parental rights, small businesses, calls out how COVID was so mishandled in New Jersey, and what's up with the wind turbines, right? We talks about that a lot. And so he dissects the political landscape on local, state, and national levels. Callers to his show often have their information gathered so that he could appear at and shine a spotlight on their small business or their cause. And he founded the Common Sense Club to do what the name implies, engage Americans who believe that there are common sense solutions to our nation's problems. And it's such a privilege to have him here today. I introduce to you Bill Spadia. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Um, it is so great to be among so many patriots. Thank you. Round of applause for you. Look, we are going to take this country back. We are going to take this state back. I come today bearing some great news that the movement to take the state back is already underway and growing fast. There are now 105,000 members of the Common Sense Club. 105,000 members in just a year. You know, and I appreciate the introduction and the mention of the show and the fact that people call in. And if you listen to the show, how many of you listen to the show? So thank you. So, and I appreciate that. Thank you. It, you know, the, the show has grown, as you know, um, over the past few years. And I, I love to tell this quick story that when I was on the air, 
it, now I've been on the air eight years, and it's been the number one show for eight years in the morning. I was at a 4.2 rating before the lockdowns, before COVID, before all the nonsense, and it was a good rating for a radio show. And then the world turned completely upside down, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, groups like yours and others, where you'd get a handful of people that would get together, all of a sudden had hundreds and dozens of people across the state saying, wait a minute, something's wrong. How did it get to a point where we have a governor that would go on national television and say the Bill of Rights was beyond his pay grade? He said those words. How is it possible that we have a governor that was allowed to use his pen with an executive order to take away the liberties of our nurses, our teachers, our elderly, our children. It all happened before our eyes. And from February 2020, I started yelling about it on the radio before we even locked down as a state because there were some obvious things that were happening with COVID. The number one thing was it clearly never came from a wet market and a bat. That was pretty clear in February 2020, right? But they lied to us, didn't they? The government lied to us because they had a narrative, they had an agenda. Their agenda was to saddle up with big pharma and big hospitals and all the money of the elites and say, the peasants don't matter. We're gonna jab them, we're gonna mask them, we're gonna isolate them, we're gonna close their businesses, we're gonna keep their kids home. We're gonna do that while the governor paraded around with Black Lives Matter, attacking our brave police across the state, across the country. While we watched Antifa and Black Lives Matter burn down cities, lives were lost, businesses destroyed. While all that was happening, they were sticking a swab up your nose that you had to prove that you were allowed out of your house. It was disgusting. It was tyrannical. It was criminal and they need to be held accountable. And that's why I do what I do. When, when, I look, when I look at where we were in February 2020, a year into fighting every day, and every week I got called out by our corporate leaders saying, what are you doing? You're reposing Dr. Fauci? What are you doing? And I'm like, so me, like many of you, I'm a bit of a contrarian. When they kept coming after me and saying, you're wrong, people are dying, the government's not lying, it's safer to be isolated, it's safer to stay home and keep your opinions to yourself, I went the other way and doubled down. And here's what happened. I went from a 4.2 to a 9.4 share of the market. That's what happened. Thank you. Now, I don't say that to say it's a great show. It's a pretty good show. Okay, you can clap for that. That's all right, that's all right. But I don't say it for that reason. I say it because I'm only speaking the truth that most Americans have in their heads anyway. I'm no pioneer, I'm no genius, I'm no smarter than anybody in this room, but I see the truth the way you see the truth. And what people have wanted for years is someone to speak the truth, someone to lead with the truth, someone to take the hits for saying the truth, and that's what my job is. That's my job. So, you're welcome. Let me tell you, we have just begun to fight. We are just getting started just getting started. The fact that we have a convention of states call in New Jersey, and I can tell you, I talk to politicians every day. Some of the conversations, you feel like you need a shower after you talk to these guys, it's terrible. But believe it or not, you wouldn't know it during COVID, but believe it or not, there are some good Republicans out there. There are some that have just been hammered so much by the elites and the money and the special interests, but they're now starting to rise up. And there are some that you would say, wow, that guy is a real moderate, I can't believe it. They've all signed on to Convention of States because they know we have to take this country back. We have to make sure that this constitution is preserved and protected and championed. And you know what? We're gonna have to add a few things on the way, aren't we?
We have to add a few things because government has taken too much liberty. The founders left a little bit too much for some of these fascists that we see in power to interpret and they interpret it. They interpret it the way they want and they think that they come after your businesses, your families, your communities. Look what's happening in New Jersey. We have a revolving door of criminals because of bail reform. Bail reform allows somebody that beats up their wife to go to a jail only to be returned onto the streets in two hours. Well, if that was the answer, I'd like to know what the question was that they were trying to solve, because that can't be tolerated. And it won't be tolerated because average people are rising up. We have more than a million people that tune into this show. And you know what? There are a third Democrat, a third independent, and a third Republican. This is not Republican versus Democrat. This is normal versus crazy. That's what it is. And by the way, we're the normals. We're the normals, right? It's okay to say normal. It's okay to say, I, as a mom or a dad, have the right to raise my kids without the government telling me what they should be taught, right? It is normal to say a seven-year-old should not be able to go into school and decide that instead of Johnny today, he's Jenny without the school telling the parents. That's what's going on. It's got to stop. We have to end career politicians. We have to end career bureaucrats that, that retire at 45 and then they move to South Dakota and we have to pay their pension and their health care and everything else. Why are we doing that? Why, how did government become just a pool of takers where the rest of us who have to work for a living have to continue to throw money down this black hole? It's not fair. It's not right. Meanwhile, our roads aren't being fixed. Meanwhile, our communities are suffering under a lack of police officers and a rise of criminals. We have to take our streets back, and we're going to do it together. We're going to do it. So I want to leave you with this. There are some laudable goals with the Convention of States. I want you to know a couple things. Number one, I'm with you. That's number one. Number two, I'm with you because of the idea of bringing we the people back to say, let's take back control of our nation, our communities, our state. And the way we do it is we go back 200 years and say, wait a minute, we had a rule book. They made it pretty clear that we, the people, have rights. We better get that back, and we're going to get it back. And I'm going to tell you this. In 2022, I'll leave you with this little piece, and I want to take some questions if you've got them. In 2022, all the media said, there's going to be a red wave. There's going to be a red wave, and there'll be dozens and dozens of new Republicans elected to the House. And then when it didn't happen, what did they say? See, Republicans are wrong. They weren't that popular all along. Let me tell you something, the media lied. They lied completely, why? Because they painted a picture that this was gonna be like 1994. Now, I'm old enough to remember 1994, the Democrats had had control of the House for 40 years and Newt Gingrich had a contract with America and swept in 54 new Republican members of Congress. We took it back. It was a day and a year to celebrate. Well, here was the difference. In 1994, we could count votes on election day. Can't do it now, I don't know why. Something happened along the way. So they set up the failure. Why did they do that? They wanna discourage us, they wanna diminish your impact. They want you to think that you are dependent on the government, and you know what, you are not. But let me leave you with this. No one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. And that's why, despite the media lies in 2022, we elected, as a grassroots organization, working with a number of others, 447 new members of the school board in New Jersey in 2022. 447. And guess what? They were moms and dads, most of whom who had never run for office before. That's how you take back your community. That's how you fight back. So 2022 was just a beginning. In 2023, we're going to elect more school board members, council members, mayors, commissioners, members of the assembly, and hopefully a few state senators. And then in 2024, we're going to come at it again. God willing, we'll have a new president in 2024. But no matter who is president in 2024, we've watched what it means to have a corrupt 
and complicit legislature. We've watched what it means to have a governor who dismisses your rights, who dismisses your very livelihoods, and in the case of our seniors, their lives. So by 2025, we're gonna elect a new governor and we're gonna take this state back. Thank you for being here, thank you. Thank you, Just thank you. Any questions? I'll be happy to take a few questions while I'm here. Jim, if we have time. Great. Yes. When are you running for governor? <laughs> All right, let me say this. My attorneys were very specific about this. They said, when you get that question, it is okay to say, the thought has crossed my mind. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. It's an open seat in 2025, but I say this in all seriousness, as much as we are going to elect a new governor, a governor that understands common sense, a governor that values small business, families, communities, values police officers and first responders and nurses, as much as we know that has to happen in 25, we have to win in 23 and 24. We have to be active. You know, we can't wait for one person to come in. We gotta build it from the ground up. We're gonna do it together. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, young lady. Your words bring hope. And um, I think, oh, I don't want this. One hundred percent. And I've already been doing it. And, and the reason I'm here today uh, is because I wanted you to hear firsthand. You know, when government locked us down, they had a very specific reason for doing it. We now know it wasn't about health, wasn't about safety. It was about isolation. Because when the people are isolated, when the people are kept silent, the elites and the government continue to run roughshod over our rights. I'm here, and my wife Jody is here, and she and I have been on the road now for a year. Thank you. We're married 28 years. And, and we're out and about in groups of 100, in groups of five. We, had a, a, we went to a, a farm stand, a, a feed supply store today in Farmingdale, had 30 people there. We're going everywhere because you deserve to hear more than me talk about it on the radio. You deserve more than an email and an advertisement and a text. You deserve more than, hey, I've got a couple good ideas, now send us a check. You deserve to see face to face who the face of the people who are actually gonna fight and take the hits and take down our enemy because our enemies are the enemies of all free thinking people across this country. People of faith are under attack. People who believe that they have the right and the power and should have it to raise their families and stand up for their communities under attack. We're under attack by multinational conglomerates. We're under attack by big oil. All they're doing is diversifying their portfolios to put wind power off the Jersey shore. They're killing whales, they're killing dolphins. But beyond that, they don't care about your property value, about your families. You know what they don't care about? They don't care if you have to suffer by having the lights turned off eight hours a day. Do you know they have rolling blackouts and brownouts in California? So when you ask that question, the answer is a resounding and powerful yes, because we have to do this, but we can't stop at just meetings like this. We've got to go home and tell people, look, there's an election coming up. And as much as all of you may hate the mail-in ballot, take my word for it, mail those ballots in. Mail those ballots in. Look, the corruption is already here. We have to outvote the corruption. We have to outpace it. I could see, let's just say, for example, hypothetical, if I'm in a situation in January of 2026 to audit every single county clerk in all 21 counties and find out what their chain of custody is for these ba ballots, find out why we are sending ballots, even though the law says 
you have to sign off that you requested it, but we send it to you anyway. We're going to change all that. But we have to get there first. And the only way to get there is to go through the obstacle course, this terrain that has been set up by the elites. we got to crawl through glass to get there, and I'm going to crawl through that glass with you. All right. Any other questions? Yes, in front. Thank you very much. I sure. appreciate it. I went to high school in Farmingdale, 1986. It's a great town, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really is a great town. My question, kind of, you touched on it. It's about voting, but we need to go back. I know Florida's doing it right. Uh, these ESNS, die ball machines, all of them, they're corrupt. I've yes. watched numbers go backwards on CNN. I turned on CNN because I wanted Sorry. to. Sorry. Yeah, I don't watch it, but uh, during the election, I just, and I saw the numbers going backwards. How do we get rid of these voting machines? This is George Soros. This is somebody so after our sovereignty. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to level with you. For years, I thought we had to modernize, and I thought it would be smart if we were able to vote on machines, even through the internet. And then I watched, I watched how these corrupt powers have taken advantage of that. I defended Diebold actually uh, years ago, saying, guys, they run our ATMs. We have to feel secure in our voting. You know what, I was wrong. Because then we look at what's happening with the banks. We look at what's happening with the small banks. They're coming after your savings accounts. They're coming after your value. They're coming after your very future, all the things you hold. You now have reason to be suspect with those electronic numbers that show your life savings. I get it. So how do we get rid of it? We have to take power. We have to take power. And I say this to my Republican friends. A lot of Republicans say, we've got to limit the power of the governor. The governor in New Jersey is the most powerful executive in the country. No governor has as much power as the governor of New Jersey. And we watched that play out as our governor took away our rights and shut down our state for two years, still forcing mandates. Uh, uh, you know, nurses are still masked. Nurse Jen is here. Give her a round of applause. Nurse Jen, uh, you may know her, one of the leaders in the medical freedom movement, uh, still suffering, still fighting every day, every day. So the answer to your question is, we can't do anything today, but my Republican friends say, you've got to limit the power of the governor. And I have one answer, not yet. Not yet, because we have to get power and use that power to roll back the tyranny that has crept in over the past 20 years. We have to audit all of these voting machines. How is it possible that you could be disenfranchised in Morris County, in Mercer County. You're telling me your right to vote depends on the county you live in and the contract that some corrupt county commissioner board signed with a voting, with a voting machine company? Completely corrupt. I wanna audit all 21 counties. And until you can show me that those machines are isolated, not hackable, and printing a receipt so you know your vote counted, then I don't want to hear it. I'd rather go back to paper ballots and a pencil, if that's what it takes, to fight for the integrity of our vote. So that's where we're going to go with it. All right, next question. Yes, gentlemen, and then later behind him. Hey, Bill. Uh, when I was up in uh, Califon, I was able to listen to you. Now I'm in Upper Bergen County, and you're static. So, All right. <laughs> But I heard the, uh, your Common Sense Club. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it yeah. and how we can support that? So, thank you. T two things. Number one, if you live in an area where 101.5 FM is static, go on your phone and download the app. It's a free app. It's NJ1015, and you can subscribe to my show right there. It's free. You click on it, and then you turn your phone on, and when I'm on in the morning, it comes up. Now, I happen to be the only host that they do not offer a podcast to. I can't imagine why. <laughs> so it's okay, because you can listen live from, 10, from 6 to 10 in the morning, and then you can sign up on my channel on Rumble, and you can get all this on BillSpadia.com. There is a link to my streaming show. I've got a new show called Common Ground. We're live every Thursday from 4.30 to 5.30. I take calls just like the morning radio. We're building an audience. We just signed a deal with On New Jersey, which is a streaming channel on Roku. So if you have a Roku-enabled television, go to Roku, look up On NJ, and I'm the first show that pops up now. 
So you can see that. Now, as far as Common Sense Club, there's a website you can go to. It's called Join the Fight 2023. Jointhefight2023.com. You can sign up for free. But if you want to sign up as a member for 10 bucks a month or more, we'll also welcome your contributions. And I say that because this takes a Herculean effort. And I ask people, look, not, not everybody can be a donor. That's okay. And I ask people, even if you have $5 or $10, that's helpful. It's every little bit counts. When you look at the movements around this country, when you look at some of the left-wing movements, how did Bernie Sanders become so popular and powerful? I mean, he's lost it, but that's a separate story. How did Barack Obama defeat the Clintons? Well, he did it with small donations. Barack Obama raised hundreds of millions of dollars in small donations. No donation is too small, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. So I ask you to consider that, but you can go to commonsenseclub.org or you can go to jointhefight2023.com and sign up. And what I'd ask you to do today, my assistant Sharon is here. Give her a hand, hand, round of applause. Sharon does a great job. Her sister Meredith is in the back. Give her a round of applause too. She's been with us. And Arun, Arun has been traveling with us. Uh, I, I wanna thank all our team, they've been great. And we, we survive on the generosity of volunteers and donors and average folks. But uh, we have a sign-up sheet going around. If you want to put your email on it, we'll add you to the list. Again, it doesn't cost you anything. We want to have you one way or the other. But at jointhefight2023.com, you have a chance to be a part of the Common Sense Club. And once a month, I do a Zoom call where you can interact. And we talk and we have a live call because, again, it's face-to-face. If you think about the first American Revolution, it happened in the taverns, it happened in the churches, it happened in the, uh, you know, in the uh, living rooms and the dining halls. It happened because people got together one-on-one -on -one and there's nothing to leave to the imagination when I'm talking to you directly and telling you exactly how we're gonna fight to take this country back. It starts with our communities, which starts with the school boards, it moves to the counties, it goes to the state, and eventually by the late 2020s, we're gonna have a country that we can say, thank God we fought. Thank God we fought hard because we all wanna leave this country better for our kids and our grandkids. And right now we're going the wrong way. You got the, you've got a war in Ukraine that we should never have been involved with. You've got a Congress that would rather send money to continue the money laundering in Kiev. We've got homeless veterans. We've got children who are being killed by fentanyl. We've got an open border and we're sending our treasure to Ukraine to protect their border. So clearly at a national level, we have a crisis. But that crisis is only gonna be solved if we dig deep. And it starts with those elections that never get any press. That's why I focus on the school board. That's why I focus on building our list. 105,000 members strong. I hope every one of you can join the fight, 2023.com and join us to take this country back. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate the time. I'll be around for a couple of minutes uh, to say hello, but thank you so much. All right, so um, it's Bill's birthday today. Bill, I was told I had to do this. So why don't we all sing happy birthday to Bill? I'll start it off. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bill, happy birthday to you. Okay. Nice job, nice job. Thank you very much. I hope my voice wasn't too bad for everyone. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do our raffle. So we have three prizes to give out. Uh, where are they? The first prize is a Convention of States mug. So we're gonna have somebody from the audience pick out the prize or the raffle ticket.
right? So we picked three. So, sir, can you read off the uh, first number for us? Okay. Uh -oh. 758. 9650758. 758. Anyone? Yes. Oh, great. Nice. Here you go, ma'am. Thank you, thank you for attending. All right, the second uh, prize is a Convention of States hat to be worn proudly. All right, so it's 9650721. Oh, there you go. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, and now our last prize is a Convention of States shirt with term limits now on it. 9650735. Anyone? 965. Here you go, ma'am. Here you go. Congratulations. All right, folks. So real quick, wait, I got I just if you haven't signed our petition, we have petitions to be signed out, out front. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering or you have any questions, just see any of the folks with the Convention of States buttons or uh, clothing on. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and drive safe. Take care.